This video is sponsored by Black Eye Games. Hey everybody, it's Party Elite, and today we're taking a look at the recently released Siege Survival Gloria Victus. With a very unique take on a medieval city under siege, Siege Survival Gloria Victus mixes storytelling with survival strategy and resource management to deliver an experience that provides an emotional roller coaster of death, destruction, and if you're good, deliverance. If this sounds interesting to you, I'll have a link in the description and pinned comment down below where you can learn more and pick it up. There's a lot going on in this game, and some of it goes well beyond the gameplay itself. So, let's take a look at what makes Siege Survival Gloria Victus stand out. The Narrative From the first cutscene to the initial decision-making moments, the narrative aspect of Siege Survival Gloria Victus embodies the despair of being under siege. The city has fallen, and you have witnessed the brutal murder of many of its citizens. Every time you step out of the safety of the castle, you see the harrowing reality of the circumstances, and bodies strung up on trees are the least of your concerns. Through your own decision-making, pragmatism or perhaps a kind heart takes the helm in a way that will impact the rest of your story right off the bat, and then again and again and again as decisions come up. Now, I don't want to spoil too much, but right near the beginning, within the first hour of the game, you come across a woman burying her son. You can help her, or you can instead steal the axe she's trying to bury alongside her son and run off with it. Now, you need the axe to help with the defenses, but can you really rob this woman who's already burying her loved one? And surely helping her comes with a different reward, right? These kinds of decisions come up often, and though sometimes black and white, they're sometimes represented in a morally muddy sort of way asking you to make some tough choices. You're introduced to multiple characters over the course of the campaign, some your superior, barking orders at you to try and keep the siege defense up and running, and some your fellow citizen, down on their luck, and others still, also your fellow citizens, but possibly able to join you in helping the defenses. And though the thought of an entire game set in a city under siege might sound small scale, the city itself is quite large, and there are multiple alleys and avenues of exploration with many events and encounters across the board. There are some plans in the future as well with regards to how additional storylines can be added to the game, but we'll touch on that later. Now of these events and encounters, you may never engage with some, and some that you engage with might have extremely surprising outcomes depending on which character triggered the event, what their skill set is, and how you choose to react. You can literally kill the people you were supposed to recruit without realizing it might happen. You can break a leg while scavenging for raw materials, finding yourself on the literal and metaphorical back foot as you try to heal up before the next assault. Fail to do so, and your character might just drop dead from their wounds. Again, the core narrative might go on, but the details will all be different, and the stories and circumstances that involve will be different as well. Different scenarios will also give you entirely different starts, but even if you play the same scenario multiple times, you never know when a missed meal or a particularly accurate shot from a trebuchet will change the course of your playthrough. The Characters and Their Needs If the name of the game doesn't give it away, survival is at the heart of the experience, and while we've seen similar concepts in other games, I don't think I've ever felt the screws tighten quite as hard as quickly as they do here. First, it's important to note that you don't just play as a single character. Some scenarios start that way, but you can quickly add more to your party, and other scenarios start with more than one character to begin with. Each character has things they're better or worse at, and these characters are a resource in and of themselves, since more hands means more work can be done faster, but they're also a burden, since more mouths means, well, more mouths to feed. It's a siege, folks. Food isn't going to come easy. So, when you stumble across an event for the first time and have the option to either recruit somebody or let them go, never to see them again, you're looking at the first resource you have to manage, dead in the eye. Each character you do take charge of has a few basic needs, like sleep, food, and water. But, they can also fall ill, be injured, or suffer from the mental anguish of living under siege. Each of these needs can exist in a few different states at different degrees of severity, with the best being sated, and the worst being deathly. Leaving these unattended will result in your character either passing out or dropping dead. It's tempting to work to the edge of death at times, especially when things need urgent crafting, but not only does work rate and efficiency drop when these needs are unmet, 
the characters will, again, literally drop dead if you push them too far, and this will in turn sadden any other characters who were with them, and then, you know, it's a downward spiral from there. The somewhat non-dramatic and sudden death of a character itself is also really kind of dark and jarring in a fitting way. The corpse needs to be burned, lest they spread disease, and just like that, one of your player characters is no more. Sleeping, when night falls, sates the first need, and food and water the next two. The more complex needs require both rest as well as either medicine or bandages, and emotional wounds only time and good fortune can heal. Pairing it down to those simple terms might make it sound easy, but keeping people alive is anything but. A complex supply chain. I'm not about to describe every chain here, but bear with me for a second as I talk about the most basic of needs as a way to showcase just how complex things can get. Chickens lay eggs. Pigs lay... something else. Both can be slaughtered for their meat, but they're valuable alive. Eggs can be eaten right out the chicken. Fertilizer can be used to grow herbs and vegetables at the garden plot. Eggs can be cooked into a meal with the help of firewood. Vegetables need to be dried to preserve them, but in either form, they too can be cooked into meals. Or you can eat them raw, just like the aforementioned herbs, and though that's less efficient, it does work in a pinch. Meat needs to be butchered, and while you can eat raw meat, at the risk of getting sick, you'd be better off cooking it into a meal, or drying it to preserve it for eventual cooking. Upgrade your fireplace with the help of a pot made with a furnace, and you can now prepare larger meals more efficiently, using less firewood and fewer ingredients per cook. And that's good, because now you're saving the firewood for other uses, and you're saving, say, herbs to make medicine. But the pig and chicken we talked about earlier, well, they need to eat too. You can give them some of your food, or you can prepare feed specifically for them, costing you time and resources, but overall, being more efficient. But if you keep them alive, they provide you with eggs, fertilizer, meat, so on and so forth. And this is just scratching the surface on food. Don't even get me started on establishing rat traps and using food as bait in the hopes of catching rats for their meat. Water is easier to follow. You either collect clean water through rainwater harvesting, or you boil dirty water over your fireplace using a firewood to make clean water that you can drink. Now, in a worst case scenario, you can drink dirty water, but that can cause sickness as well. I think it's pretty plain to see how some seemingly simple problems have rather complex solutions to them. And not only do they have complex solutions, but they have multiple solutions, each one with its own pros and cons. For example, there are bandages of varying qualities, medicines of various qualities, different types of tools, different qualities of cloth, different types of construction material, and different types of weapons and armor to make too. Some of these, as mentioned before, your characters need just to survive. Others, they need to build or upgrade the structures needed to manufacture the things they need to survive in the first place. Almost all of these, however, are needed by the soldiers to fight. Assisting the fight. You're no warrior in Siege Survival Gloria Victus. You might get into the occasional tussle, and you'll be lucky to get out of it alive, but the real fighting happens at the Bastion, and in the defense against the attacking army, you're just the support. Which means you're integral to its success. The fighting at the wall isn't constant. The city is under siege, and every so often, the enemy will try to mount an assault. During the assault, you'll need to provide the aforementioned support, though you'll also need to dodge rocks, put out fires, burn corpses, and do more things that I don't quite want to give away. They're fun surprises when they come. Now, if the Bastion manages to hold the assault back, the game goes on. They can only fail so many times before it's game over. Every battle shows a comparison of strength on either side, and over multiple phases, these numbers will shift to reflect the tide. The number on your side is determined by the resources available at the Bastion during the battle. At any point in time, you're able to send resources to the Bastion, and often there'll be an urgent need of some of these items. Defenders at the wall need to be fed, watered, armed, and armored. The wall itself needs to be patched up from time to time, and wounded soldiers will occasionally need patching up too. Weapons and armor will get damaged and be sent to you for repairs with the help of your resources, and as with everything else, you'll need to weigh the value of saving time and sending lower quality stuff, or taking time to prepare more efficient items. While water and food are constant needs of the Bastion, just as they are for your people, medicine and bandages are just needed for poor health and wounds, and everything else, like weapons and construction material, they are needed during or just before a battle begins, 
though you can send them in advance if you wish. Some of these items have a larger impact on the Bastion's strength than others, but they can be harder to manufacture. In some of the later battles though, they're absolutely essential in order to swing the balance of power in your favor. And ultimately, it's also important to keep in mind that your own people and the Bastion need many of the same resources to survive, so you're constantly trying to balance their and your needs. Neither of the two can be allowed to perish. If the defenders at the Bastion die, the city falls, and if you, their support structure and supply line dies, the city falls. In a desperate situation, you might need to let somebody on your team starve or even die in order to supply the Bastion, especially if you weren't able to scavenge enough raw materials overnight. Scavenging, scouting, and other nighttime activities. There's little time to rest when defending a siege. Now, sometimes your characters will desperately need to sleep at night lest they pass out from fatigue or die from disease and wounds during the day when they're supposed to be producing goods. If they're not sleeping though, they can leave the safety of the stronghold for a few different tasks. Scouting gives you intel on upcoming assaults by the enemy. While you don't need to do it right off the bat, story reasons eventually compel you to get involved more and more as time goes on. Knowing what you're up against and when you're going to be up against it helps you plan what resources to produce and in what order to make sure that the Bastion is appropriately ready to defend when the time comes. Later on, your scouting provides other benefits for you when defending against an assault too. Scouting is relatively passive, as is sleeping, but scavenging sees you assuming direct control in the dead of night. There are a few secret passages connecting the castle to the city, and you'll have to unlock more through various actions, allowing you to start your scavenging at different parts of the city. As you can imagine, the different parts of the city have various resources in more or less abundance, and depending on what you're hoping to find, you're going to want to try and make your way over accordingly. You'll also need to take some resources with you from time to time. A shovel to remove obstacles, a torch to burn corpses, etc, etc. These can be scavenged, but if you want to guarantee having one, you'll need to build one during the day to carry out at night. Since the city has fallen into enemy hands, scavenging plays out as a bit of an isometric stealth game. You make noise as you move around, the enemy patrol can spot or hear you, and if they see you, they'll start attacking you. Wounds you take will need to be healed back at the castle, and the next time you visit the city, the guard will be raised unless you remain unspotted for a few consecutive nights, in which case they'll let their guard down. Apart from gathering resources, you'll also come across events from time to time. These can be objectives driven by the greater story, or they can exist outside the story, simply as things that are happening around the city. You'll come across survivors that might join you, some that might trade with you, and others that might fight you. You'll come across stashes of goods, sometimes acquiring them at the expense of your humanity, and you'll often have unexpected consequences to your decisions. Your character's strengths and weaknesses will come to play here, and you'll come across situations from time to time where you'll have wished you had somebody else or some other equipment before you engaged. And this is definitely reason to come back over and over again to see how different situations might play out with different skills and equipment on hand. Ultimately, all your activity at night is restricted by time, and in fact, during the day as well. As the sun starts to rise, you'll be more easily spotted, and if you don't make it out in time, you'll get spotted sneaking around in broad daylight. You have to rush over to one of the secret passages you've unlocked before the day starts in order to return to the castle with your haul. Once you return, as the day begins, your scavenging character will be worse for wear. They'll be tired from the night's activities, and they'll be hungrier, thirstier, and any status effects like sickness or wounds will be carried over. And so the cycle continues. Build, manufacture, and fight during the day, sleep, scout, and scavenge during the night, week after week, until one side wins and the other falls. A bright future. The developers are keen on creating an experience with legs. Not only does the game have a more challenging New Game Plus mode, slightly different versions of the base scenario, and a customizable start with various sliders and modifiers, but there's also a full-fledged scenario editor for building and sharing custom stories. This is the same tool that the developers use to build the core game scenario, and it looks like, though the overall geometry of the levels are preset for now, you are able to establish patrols, place piles for pickups, determine starting stats for characters as well as the bastion and the enemy, and you can even determine how hunger, thirst, and fatigue are applied. You can establish events, write your own event text, 
This is a very thorough tool, and it means that the developers will be able to add new story scenarios easily, and if modders take up the task, we can see many, many more scenarios in quick succession. The devs have stated that they're working with modders to bring some cool new scenarios in the very near future through modding contests, and the devs themselves have already committed to a few major updates as per their roadmap, with more dynamic events changing things up in the later parts of a playthrough, and a new desert scenario releasing in late June that will supposedly play completely differently. I can already imagine how water scarcity comes into play in a desert scenario, but what else might be involved? And considering how this is a complete change of scenery and everything, I suspect the devs have more of these up their sleeves in the hopes that modders will also be able to use each to produce their own stories in this world at war. Siege Survival Gloria Victus is an indie game with a laser focus. You're trying to survive a siege. The way this laser focus has evolved into multiple gameplay systems, a complex supply chain, in-depth character and resource management all held together by a narrative with a decent amount of player agency, that is why Siege Survival Gloria Victus stands out from the crowd. The dark tone, the grit, and the need to survive all challenge the player in different ways, and the tense gameplay loop constantly applies pressure on you as a defender counting down the days to the inevitable. I hope this video has given you some insight on Siege Survival Gloria Victus, and if you have any questions, thoughts, or opinions of your own you'd like to share, feel free to do so in the comments down below. Like I mentioned earlier, if you'd like to grab the game for yourself, you can do so at the link in the description and pinned comment down below. Now, as always, I read all the comments, so I'd love to hear what you think and what you're most curious about, and I'll try and bring you what answers I can. And make sure to subscribe for more strategy gaming content, and as always, a massive thanks goes out to all of the channel members and patrons who've been sworn to the channel on a monthly basis. Y'all keep us alive and running smoothly. And of course, a big ol' thanks goes out to each and every one of you for watching. Until next time, cheers.